Cheers. Guten Tag. Thank you so much for having me here. My name is Lynnie Ryan, and I am a magazine addict. Um, and this is the first magazine that started my addiction. When I was in high school, I used to skip school and go to the community college in my neighborhood and hang out at the library with my friends and like do bad things that high school kids do. And I discovered this magazine. It's called Yolk. And it was the first magazine that I had ever seen that had people that looked like me on the cover.、Um, it's a really weird thing growing up in Texas in the 90s as an Asian American to be a child and have to tell adults that yes, I'm American, yes, I'm from Texas. When they asked me where I was from, and so when I found Yolk, I realized like, wow, Asian Americans are out there. There are artists, there are actors, there's musicians, there are designers, and at that moment, I realized that magazines were these magical portals where I could connect with a community beyond myself and something that's bigger than who I am. And at that moment, I knew I wanted to make magazines. So for the next 20 years, that's basically what I did. Um, I've worked at a number of different magazines across a lot of different genres. I've also worked for brands that include streetwear brands and also food brands.、Um, I've had a lot of little different kind of、uh, trips along the way, including starting my own barbecue company in Brooklyn, where I live. And、uh, this is barbecue brisket sandwiches that are kind of an homage to what I grew up eating in Texas. But in 2011. When I was editing this online design magazine called Core 77, it's an online resource for industrial designers.、Um, I came across this magnificent thing.、Um, this is a concept by Philips, and it's called the microbial home. So the premise is basically that kitchens of the future can be powered by our waste. As you can see, there's this beautiful brass body that makes up the standalone kitchen island. And what you do is you basically dump all your food scraps into the body of this、uh, island. And as your food decomposes, as you compost your food, your food actually releases methane. And then what happens is that this、uh, methane powers the light above the kitchen、uh, island. It also creates gas for your stove. And、um, what I liked about this idea is that it was so provocative, but it was also poetic. It's efficient and it's a closed-loop system, and the idea that the kitchens of the future could be biological machines just totally enchanted me.、Um, at the time, projects like this were really not being written about in mainstream media. So, if you're a design publication, and I was a design journalist and a design editor. Um, I was really focused on like furniture and lighting and interior objects. And if you're a food magazine, you, you just look at this thing and you're like, "This thing is so weird. Like, I don't even know how to talk about it." So in this gap, I was really inspired to kind of start a personal project that looked at the intersection of food and design. And so in 2013, I launched Mold、um, as an editorial platform to talk about these projects and these ideas. And since then, we published 400 stories online.、Uh, we've done collaborations with different designers. We've done exhibitions,、um, events with places like Sonos.、Um, we have a monthly talk around where we talk about the future of food.、Um, we've done pop-ups with the Future Food Cafe, and we amassed a crazy Instagram following of like 35,000 people. Um, but why are we interested in design, and why the future? Well, how many of you here know that we're facing a food crisis? One. Maybe there's other people in the back. Two. Yes. Two. Three. There's three people in this entire room that know that we're facing a coming food crisis. In 2014, I was writing about this project for Mold. It's a poster design project from an Australian designer named Gemma Warner. 
And as you can see, it's an infographic using fruits and vegetables as a vehicle for telling a story. And that story is actually a terrifying one, and it's a warning from the United Nations that by the year 2050, which is not very far off, if we continue eating and drinking the way that we do today, we will not be able to feed the nine billion people that will be on this planet. That's a crazy, terrifying thing. I believe that designers, with their human-centered design process, with their ability to communicate ideas, um, with their kind of training to frame the right questions, have a very critical role to play in creating a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable food system. As you know, right now, there are plenty of people in the world who are coming up with interesting ideas for uh, you know, urban agriculture, um, maybe it's lab-grown meat, but designers have a more interesting role to play. And it's, you know, it could be about creating new typologies for food. So this is an amazing project by a design studio called Live In Studio, and it's a concept. It's basically a home growing system, but what you're growing is fungi. It's called the fungi mutarium. So underneath this glass dome is actually a place that you can cultivate fungi, which are mushrooms, and each of those little cups are filled with uh, mycelium spores, which are the roots of the fungi. And what's interesting about fungus and mushrooms is that some of them actually can be fed waste plastic. So the concept is that you would actually grow your own food by feeding it waste plastic, and then you can eat these beautiful mycelium cups and take the nutrition from the fungus itself. What I love about this project is that it actually speaks to what happens when food gets personal. And that's kind of at the crux of why I started a magazine, a print magazine. After three years of publishing online, I realized that it wasn't enough to create a digital archive of interesting food design projects. I wanted to make something that designers would get intimate with. Similar to what Paul was talking about, I wanted to make something that designers would smell, that they would touch, page through, maybe they would take home with them, maybe they would get in bed with it, maybe they would have coffee, you know, have a leisurely date on a Saturday afternoon. I really just wanted to make slow media. So, in order for to do that, I actually reached out to a total stranger that I wanted to get into a professional bed with, and that, um, Basically, a, about a year before I decided I wanted to make a magazine, a friend of mine showed me the work of a designer named Eric Hu. So, to see Eric Hu's work, which is what's on the screen, was really startling for me. I had never seen graphic design work that really had an emotional resonance for somebody like me and my personal history growing up Asian American in Texas in the 90s. So, I reached out to Eric sight unseen, and I said, hey, do you want to work on this magazine with me? Um, at the time, Eric was moving from New York to Montreal to become the design director for an fashion, online fashion retailer called Essence. But he decided to take on the project. And so with him and his design partner, Matthew Sang, um, we decided to create a magazine that would create an intellectual scaffolding and visual language for the future of food. So, consumption. Um, basically, all of you guys are familiar with the tropes of a typical food magazine. Food magazines are really about fetishizing food. Um, they are about foodie culture. Um, it's about food as a commodity, food as a status symbol. Maybe there's some restaurant reviews, but there's like a lot of soft light. There's recipes. There's a lot of white people eating avocado toast. And to be honest, this kind of tweed treatment of food, something that is so critical, something that is so urgent, just totally makes me angry. And I wanted to turn shit upside down. And so that's what we did. A lot of people have described Eric's work as maximalist. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of energy there, but what appeals to me is actually his bold and nuanced, but most importantly, unapologetic use of typography and illustration across various subjects, 
uh, ranging from architecture, fashion, music, art, branding. And similarly with Mold, we were making a, mag a food magazine, but through the lens of a lot of different industries, including biology, technology, science, art, and design. We were looking at food um, in a totally different way. But when we're talking about the future of food, we also needed to kind of take similar considerations. Um, at the time, Eric was talking about this in an interview, that when we were kind of concepting the magazine, this idea of future was kind of depicted in these super clean, slick lines. Um, maybe it was dystopic, like Black Mirror. Um, or maybe it kind of had like a dark feel to it. So Eric and Matt started exploring different notions around retro and future nostalgia and fetishization. And they really arrived at a typeface. And that typeface is Gyrator by the designer Stefan Elmer. As you can see, it's kind of a riff on a Victorian aesthetic. There's a kind of Rococo quality to it, a crafted feeling because it has these kind of twisted um, bodies and, and there's a serif. <laughs> but more than that, what I liked about this um, uh, about this typeface is kind of its organic intimacy. So what they did with Gyrator is they kern the letters, and then the type becomes sculptural. And it asks the readers to take a moment and to kind of lean in a little bit, to get a little closer, to get intimate, and to take a second look. And so with this logo and a dream and a feeling, we launched a year ago, almost to the day, a Kickstarter campaign to fund the first three issues of the magazine, and we made our goal. So each issue of Mold Magazine actually tackles a different theme. And so uh, it, it kind of looks at how can design help feed 9 billion people by the year 2050. And so I mentioned that we wanted to turn shit upside down with the magazine. So the first issue was actually about shit. Um, actually, it was kind of about, well, it is about the microbiome, and that's the trillions of microbial uh, collaborators that we have that live inside of us and on us. And as an editor, I wanted to think about the issue in kind of three different chunks. Uh, the first one was about fermentation, which is one of our most ancient practices for preserving food, but also for creating certain flavors in food. Uh, synthetic biology, which is about the design of living organisms, which is a new field, but is about designing uh, living things instead of objects. And then poop, um, because, you know, I love to talk about poop. Um, but because we had such provocative content, um, we obviously had to have very provocative art direction as well. And who better to hold up a mirror to the fetishization of something than fashion photographers? This is the work of Thomas McCarty. Um, he is a, oh, five minutes. Jeez. Sorry, OK, I'm going to run through this. So he's stopped for a whole bunch of fashion magazines. And so we asked him to shoot toilets. Um, this is a story that I had been wanting to do forever. Um, I basically fell in love with Toto toilets in the 90s when I went to a ramen restaurant in New York and sat on a Toto toilet for the first time. And, um, you know, the story wasn't just about, like, you know, how fabulous a Toto toilet was, but it was really about how the Toto designers have a universal design research center, and they marry this design research with um, nanotechnologies in order to create the products of the future. Uh, this is the work of a digital artist that Eric and Matt really admire. His name is Mikey Joyce. And he, as you see, he takes digital textures and layered worlds, and he turns them into these kind of amazing pieces. And so we basically paired him with this story on geophagia, and where we took archival imagery from the New York Public Library, paired it with his commission here, and really told the story about the cultural, literary, and historical significance of eating dirt um, by a writer named, and an artist and gallerist named Abby Churchill. Uh, this is a story uh, from Corey Olson, who's a still life photographer who usually works with fashion brands. And we asked him to shoot food. 
And so what might look like a story about coffee is actually a story about biotechnology and how biotech is being used to create coffee beans that have a more smooth taste and have a less acidic uh, effect on your stomach. Um, and this coffee bean design is actually based on a natural process of uh, this uh, Southeast Asian cat that eats the coffee beans, ferments the beans through its digestive system, and yes, we wanted to talk more about poop. Um, this is a love letter to the wild yeasts that are produced, that produce the unique flavors of natural wines, and it was written by Isabelle Legrand, who is the first and only female master of wine in France. And in a lot of ways, you know, the key to our success has actually been uh, avoiding working with food writers and food creatives and food photographers. Um, we really leverage our own network from the worlds of art, fashion, and design. Uh, and so by this band of outsiders, um, we created a food magazine. Um, and this is the work of the only food photographer we worked with for the first issue. Her name is Louise Hager, and this is a story that she shot for The Guardian. And so for issue one, we asked her to shoot, you guessed it, poop. Um, it was a story from Daisy Ginsburg, who's, uh, who, wrote, who basically had this concept, you know, eight years ago, that you would be able, in the future, you would be able to drink a probiotic and then while you pooped it out, it would, the color of the poop would tell you what was wrong with you. So issue two was more squarely about design. And really, it was kind of about tableware and furniture. Um, we co-edited the issue with Side and Scene, which is an online design magazine that's best known for championing emerging designers and also their use of millennial pink. Um, what was interesting is that we were making a design magazine and a food magazine, but it was decisively not a lifestyle magazine. We weren't selling anything except for our ideas. Our perspective in this issue was that objects, that with the objects that we use to feed ourselves, that's like you know, utensils, plates, the furniture we sit on, is some of the most intimate things that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, we put these things into our mouths, we caress them with our hands, they cradle our butts, they set the table for the theater of dining. And so um, this, for example, this picture is from experimental gastronomy. They're a, uh, a, a, a pop-up in Amsterdam that commissions all the tableware uh, for a vegan dinner in order to celebrate the joys of vegan eating. And this kind of sensorial aspect of dining is something that we really kind of keyed in on an issue to. Because besides sex, did you know that eating is the only thing that we do that engages all of our senses? Um, we wanted to present new ways of, uh, of eating and how, think about how can we design new relationships with our food. I mean, what are we going to eat when there's no more turkey for Thanksgiving, uh, no more orange juice for breakfast, no more chocolate for birthday cakes? Um, we, designers have the role of playing, uh, they have a role to play to actually design dining rituals using the things that we eat with and help us embrace new ingredients. Um, in new modes of eating. So this is a project by the design studio in Burton Nita in London, and it's called Algaculture. And it's a concept that basically it's a wearable farm. So as we breathe out carbon dioxide, algae actually use that to, they feed off carbon dioxide. And so as we breathe out, you're feeding the, carb the, the algae to let it grow. And then in turn, you would actually consume the algae for nutrients. Um, we are also, in, what I also love about issue two is that we were a food and design magazine that is actually hungry for more than either category could really present by itself. So at this intersection in food and design is culture. Um, if you think about it, the world that we live in is comprised of objects that were made specifically to reflect an extension of our values and created to be in service to the way that we live our lives. So this is an example from Studio Tinka, which is a Dubai-based design studio, and they basically reimagined um, the tableware that, we that is used amongst nomadic Bedouin tribes. And so they're designing tableware without the table. 
Um, here we have Sito Solanke, who is the uh, head of a design studio in London called Matter, and she works with materials. And she writes about the iconic tally plate and the rise of steel tableware in India and really kind of digs into the importance of materials and forms for thinking about the future of how we eat. And this story was shot by Corey Olson, who shot for issue one, too. Um, the art direction for issue two was really interesting because it was more nuanced than issue one. We kind of came out the gate really like swinging for issue one. And so for issue two, we, made a, we, went, we wanted to show a little bit more restraint. Um, so we pulled through some elements which include some of this gold uh, color that you see. Um, you still see gyrator. But in the front of the book, we start introducing things like uh, this uh, header font called Life LT. Um, we also were kind of focused on industrial designers, so we were able to use more archival imagery uh, in, in the issue, and then while still commissioning stories from collaborators like Thomas and uh, another photographer, Samantha Friend. Um, this story is about 10 designers from around the world, and we asked them to sketch uh, their favorite dining chairs and also tell us why it's their favorite dining chairs. And um, one of the things that I really love is uh, this quote from this um, artist named Shinokuda, who's based in Los Angeles. And I'm just going to read it really quick because I'm running out of time. He says, um, this is the three-legged chair on the left. It says, I like a chair designed for a dining table to be the accent point. The table holds the food, but the chair holds the people you are there to be with. Um, and then when talking about the future of the food, people always ask me basically two things. Uh, one is about insects, and the other is about techno foods. Um, this is a stock image. This is not from the magazine. Um, in issue two, we actually address both issues. Um, and I think that what's interesting is that both of these questions is really rooted in the real anxiety that people have around what is primitive and what does the future hold for us. So on the top of insects, we basically uh, took a totally different view, and we said, hey, there are people around the world who eat insects every day. Um, so we asked designers to, from those places that come from those gastronomic traditions to design uh, eating tools that you would harvest, um, clean, cook, and then eat insects with. Um, this is from Brazil. It's for eating farofa with queen ants. Uh, this is from Togo, uh, a U.S. designer who um, r basically drew on memories of communal feasting of termites from his native Togo. This is from Italy, uh, Preziata. They designed a cheese board and a pocket knife, which is a common tool among Sardinian men to eat this very local delicacy called Kashu Marzu, which is a maggot cheese. And this is a comb from an architectural firm in South Africa ca called Counterspace that is used to clean Mopani worms before you cook them. And then on the te topic of techno foods, um, I'm one of those people who I never want to eat a meal as a pill. And I definitely don't want to eat something that's just like you push a button and it comes out of a machine. So what we did is we asked experts who are actually working in this techno food space um, what their opinion was, what were they working on in order to separate fact from fiction. Um, here the illustrator, Andy Rolfs, kind of depicts the hardware, which is like the goggles of VR, like eating in virtual reality, but also kind of communicates some of the concern around the implications of what it means to eat in virtual reality. And what about 3D printed foods? Well, unless you're one of those people who just eats anything that comes out of a tube, um, you won't need to worry about a 3D food printed future. But there are huge swaths of the po population that will uh, really benefit from this technology, and that's the over 900 million people who are aging and growing old. And as we get old, um, a lot of people actually develop a difficulty in chewing and swallowing food. So 3D food printing technology will actually be able to deliver customized nutrients and food density for people to, that would still delight their senses. And this kind of sensorial delight is really, really at the heart of what the future of food that I want to see it looks like. Um, I think 
pleasure and joy is really critical to any uh, discussion about the future of food. So I'm here to assure you that the future of food won't be a pill or milkshake. It will be rooted in joy. It will ro be rooted in pleasure, memory, and most importantly, culture. So in making a magazine about design in the future of food has taught me anything. It's to stay hungry. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, stay, stay, stay. I just want to show everyone what Boris just made me show, Lin Yi. He's got this like super hard ass sign that says get off stage and then he won't use it himself. <laughs> so I, I had to be the one to go and execute. It's you. okay, I'm from New York, I'm totally used to it. <laughs> really, really quickly because um, we ran over time. Ran time. I know. Uh, so the magazine is available to buy yes. in the shop outside. Exactly. Lin Yi is carrying them over from the hotel 10 at a time. Yes. So <laughs> if that looks interesting to you, go and buy one quickly because there are not many of them around. Yep. But very quickly, what happens after issue three? The third issue, which we're actually wrapping up right now, is about food waste, but it's more about how can we, as cities and designers, think about food waste as a resource. But so, issue, so the first three issues were in the Kickstarter. Yep. So what happens after issue three? I need money. <laughs> so anybody who has money, come find me afterwards. Um, we are looking for partnership, and so I think it's really critical in order to build a sustainable business. Like, so this is not just like a hobby for us to do, but it's something that we really believe in and has um, that we need support to, in order to do it. So we're looking for funding for issue four. I'm crossing my fingers that I might have some people in the wings, but yeah, it's really interesting to just kind of meet with people who are interested in the magazine and interested in talking about and promoting these ideas. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Can I give you that as well? <laughs> okay, so we have uh, the, the last session uh, in this first little set. Um, we have a, a, a brand new magazine. One of the most exciting things about independent magazines is there's just new stuff coming all the time. I